Good morning and welcome to this Tuesday, August 22nd, 2023 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at Earnings Beats, and I'll be with you here for the next 30 minutes as we prepare for the trading day ahead. Um, definitely seeing a little bit of a reversal in the market, so uh, character of the market's changed a bit here over the last couple of days. Started to see a little bit on Friday, uh, certainly a lot more in terms of reversing yesterday. We're going to go over, um, obviously, the major indices and then take a look at some of the uh, stocks that had big reversals yesterday. Um, you know, it, we'll go through all of the, the various areas of the market, but there's no doubt that we were lifted somewhat by some of the key uh, aggressive areas, which probably needed to get a little bit of a lift because of options expiration last week that carries over into the week after. And uh, uh, you'll, you'll see in just a moment, but uh, some of the key areas where some stocks, some key growth stocks have been beaten down quite a bit over the last few weeks. Uh, we did see some rebound, big rebound in some of those uh, stocks yesterday. So we're going to get to all of that. Uh, right now, we've got futures uh, pointing up this morning. Uh, and again, NASDAQ leading. So many of those aggr aggressive growth names likely to lead, uh, at least at the opening bell today. Dow futures right now, uh, well, as of about 10 minutes ago, Dow futures up about 60 S&P 500 futures up 20, NASDAQ futures up 110. So on a percentage basis, NASDAQ futures up about 0.75%, whereas the s and is up a little less than uh, half of 1%, and the Dow Jones up uh, roughly about 0.2%. Uh, so uh, again, NASDAQ shares, which helped lead the rebound yesterday, again, leading this morning. It makes me a little bit nervous just because, you know, it's options. I think some of this could be options related, but it is at least getting us started in reversing a trend to the upside. What I don't want to see at this point, what we need to be careful of is another big swoosh to the downside. If we lose recent support on something like that, I would begin to grow much more cautious. That would be, you know, more of my bearish stance or my bearish take on the market. If we were to go back down at this point after seeing a reversal, I don't want to go back to it down to another low at this point. Uh, but my bullish take is that, hey, we just came down to some key resistance. We're starting to bounce. We're being led by some of the aggressive areas, which is good, but we need some other groups uh, to follow in. Uh, for instance, yesterday, the Russell 2000 finished down, even though we had a nice rally in semiconductors and some other areas. So there were some areas of the market that really didn't participate. I'd like to see that change starting today. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at what happened yesterday. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average finished down 37 points. That's kind of my point. We weren't seeing all the strength everywhere. Um, Dow, Dow was down 37. S&P 500 was up 30. The NASDAQ was up 242 points. That was 1.65%, whereas the S&P was up 0.7%. And the Dow was down 0.11%. The reason that the S&P didn't keep up with the NASDAQ is that it's not as heavily weighted with some of those aggressive growth names, especially technology. NVIDIA had a big day. Tesla had a big day. You know, those types of stocks are not weighted as heavily in the S&P as they are in the NASDAQ 100. And that's why we saw, um, you know, a little bit different story when you look at percentage change when we look across all three of those indices. Mid caps, barely up, uh, up one-tenth of 1%. There's the IWM that tracks the small cap index. That's down 0.15%. Transports, flat. So you can see this was not a wide sweeping move to the upside. It was mostly those big NASDAQ names. And those were the ones that were beaten down and had... Well, potentially, I didn't do all the calculations, but probably by the end of last week, uh, there was quite a bit of net in the money put premium. And I think some of that might be getting ironed out at the beginning of this week. So is this a real rally? Could be. Um, you do need to be aware, though, that it's it was option expiration week last week. And normally, what we see going into option expiration week is the market going higher. historically. The 11th to the 18th of calendar months tends to be strong. So 
history tells us that we normally have a nice run up heading into option expiration week. And then from the 19th to the 25th, that's when we tend to see the pullback. That's by far the worst period within a calendar month, the 19th to the 25th. So kind of got this mixed bag right now. I mean, I'm excited to see the rebound, but is it just manipulation because of options? We're probably going to find out more about that as we go throughout the week. I also want to mention it's really important. Friday, we're getting uh, Fed Chief Powell's speech, the Jackson Hole speech. And if you recall, that was the speech that really shook the market last year, where everybody thought things were getting better. We had that nice bottom in June, had a 700-point rally on the S&P 500 into the middle of August. We pulled back, had like a 20-day test. And then the Fed chief came out and said, more pain ahead for the market. And their job wasn't done, blah, blah, blah. And as a result, we saw another leg down that took us to a new low in October, slightly below the June low, but still, nonetheless, it was a new low. And from there, we started to see a normal October and November rally in the financials and industrials. And when we kicked off the new year, that's when we saw the NASDAQ take off and many of those technology names. So all that's history now, though, doesn't do us any good other than to look back as far as perspective goes. Now, where are we going from here? Um, I believe we're going higher, but I think you need to have your lines in the sand. And for me, it's going to be S&P 500 has no business, in my opinion, going below the 4,300 level. So we got down to 4,330 something, whatever it was. We closed yesterday right at about 4,400 on the S&P. So we got a couple percentage points, a little leeway to the downside, but I don't want to see that break down. So that would certainly be one thing to watch. As far as sectors go uh, yesterday, technology, there it is, your leader, 1.91%. Discretionary, 1.15%. Communication services was up almost three quarters of 1%. But when you get past that, I'm going to try to go back here and pull that up. <clears throat> Healthcare was up one-tenth of 1%. Uh, materials, 0.01%, one one-hundredth of 1% higher. Um, and then the other six uh, sectors were all lower. Financials were financials and industrials down both about one-tenth of 1%. Um, energy, I mean, the good news was the groups that were down were mostly either the neutral or the defensive groups. So we saw energy, utilities, consumer staples, and real estate. Real estate was the big loser yesterday. So money was definitely rotating away from defense into offense, which is good. But again, think opposite George week that I talk about. Normally, I'm talking about technology coming down around option expiration Friday or the week after. And normally I'm talking about discretionary stocks coming down and staples going up and utilities going up because it's the opposite effect as we head into option expiration week and for a few days after. This month is completely different. So if we're looking at option or looking at uh, op opposite George week, technology was the group that was getting hit the hardest. And so makes sense that they're bouncing back. So again, I think the theme for me this week is this an options-related bounce that we're seeing at the beginning of the week? Or is it the start of something bigger? I lean heavily toward the latter, that it's the start of something bigger to the upside. But I don't want to lose focus on the fact that if we go back down below the 4,300 level on the S&P, I think we need to just be cautious. I'm not saying, I'm not writing off the market at that point, but it's got some proving to do from a bullish perspective. If you go back down below 4,300, you lost a lot of key areas. You lost that 20-day moving average. You lost your 20-week moving average. You've lost 50-day moving averages. And at that point, you will have lost a pretty key support level because 4,305 on the S&P 500 was that high that we saw back in August of 2022, right before we saw some profit taking and then that Jackson Hole speech. Um, now, I, I mean, my feeling is that, actually, I don't know what my feeling is as far as that Fed meeting goes on Friday. Um, or not really Fed meeting, but the policy, um, you know, the policy holders getting together and talking and that Jackson Hole speech by uh, Powell. You know, I'd like to think that he's going to discuss some positives and what if, what's happened to inflation over the last year, which is steadily declining now. 
but he's thrown some curveballs recently. And if he throws another one on Friday, that could be the catalyst for a move to the downside. So you've got to be on guard. I would not just be simply, you know, off on a vacation with no internet for the next three uh, weeks or four weeks, because I think you might find a big surprise if uh, Powell goes off track again. Um, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'm not a big fan of this Fed. I don't trust them um, because they've said things in the past and they change it. Um, you know, we need to see improvement in inflation. And they started to see imp improvement inflation and then they needed consistency in that improvement. And now they've seen it for over a year and they're still talking about they're worried about inflation. It's not, you know, their job's not done. Um, I'm just not quite sure where they stand, but we're going to find out a little bit more on Friday. Just be careful. And remember, Friday's going to be a big day. All right, 10-year Treasury yield. Get an update. We do have an existing uh, home sales report coming out later this morning. That'll be out at about 10 a.m., so maybe in about 50 minutes. And existing home sales, the consensus is 4,150,000 units. Last month, and that's for the month of July, by the way, so the uh, month prior in June, the number was 4,160,000. So we're looking for a slight drop, 4,160 down to 4,150. Um, I think overall home construction has held up pretty well, um, but I'm not, I haven't been a huge fan of it just lately because of, I'll pull up the chart here real quick and show you. But we had the negative divergence. We, you know, we went up here, set a new high, the PPO never got to a new high. It held up for a little while, but notice we've now rolled over. The PPO is decidedly negative on the daily chart for the first time since October of last year. And we're also trending down below both the 20 and the 50. We're going to likely get a uh, death cross where the 20 goes below the 50. And so now it's up to the bulls to get us back up above those moving averages. So right now, home construction, even though it held up really well throughout most of the recent decline, it's kind of taken it on the chin the last few uh, three or four trading sessions. And as a result, now we're looking up at the moving averages instead of looking down at them. And that's a big difference technically. Um, S&P 500. So here's our breakdown on the S&P 500. I talked about losing the 20 day, losing the 50 day. We've lost uh, the 20 week, or actually we got down and tested the 20 week on the S&P. I can uh, pull this up. And this level right here at 43, well, the uh, 20 week is at 43.39. The low that we saw last week was 43.35. So far this week, 43.60 is our low, yeah, yesterday's low. Um, but that 43.35, just above, the 20 week moving average. And if you go back to the August high of last year, again, this would have been just maybe 10 days or so before the Jackson Hole speech. We had a high of 43.25. And I think on a daily basis, our high close was 43.05. So if you close below 4,300, you're starting to take on and lose some pretty key support. Um, if you recall, on the way up, I talked about how important it was to eventually get through 4305. Um, and I'm gonna pull up the daily chart. We'll go back and show that on the daily chart. So right here, here was that August high and I'm gonna annotate this. All right. Um, So there you see it. And the reason that this was such a big level, I mean, there were a lot of different levels that we needed to take out when we started to recover. And that's that's one of the big problems. And that's why you have to respect when we start taking out key levels, because usually you're going to have sellers lined up at key resistance areas. And so from a longer term perspective, that first move down from early January until March, late February, early March, we bounced. That was the first leg down. Then we had to move up, and I'm not an Elliott wave person, but I would count wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, and then wave five. 
um, and then a bounce back up and uh, kind of a false breakdown. But again, this right here was triggered, right? Look at this big red filled candle right here. That was August 25th last year. That was the Jackson Hole speech. That's where it started. It's where we had the big leg down that ended up taking us back below the June low. Now here we are coming back down. We went through 4,300. And again, from a long-term perspective, this is A, B, well, one, two, three, four, five. And the re reaction off of this low right here was set at 4,305. So when you go back down to put in a new low, you expect that that right there is going to hold. In order for the long-term downtrend to remain in play based on lower lows and lower highs, that 4,305 level needed to hold as resistance. And as we went up, you know, you can see we we're kind of threatening. And I saw signs, my signs were telling me we were going to all the way from last June. I thought we had ended back in the middle part of June. I thought we ended the bear market. We did go back down one more time at the end of September. I said, here's your second chance to get in. We ended up going just a little bit below. This was a bad CPI number, triggered selling at the open and early in the morning. And that was it. That was the bottom line. That was that was it. It was over. Uh, and now I think looking back, it's a lot easier to see. But at the time, there were a lot of signals pointing to it being over. Anyway, uh, we, we fast forward all the way to June. Finally, 4305 is taken out right there. And to me, that ended, that confirmed the end of the cyclical bear market. I thought it was over back at these bottoms, as I mentioned. But the confirmation, the technical confirmation, comes when you break that series of lower lows and lower highs. And that's what we saw in June. So that's 4305. Went up above, we pulled back, we held it. And then we went to new highs, got this negative divergence in play, probably needed at least a 50-day test, kind of you know, wind things down. At the time, I indicated 4305. That area was kind of my worst case scenario because I didn't think we were rolling back over to go back down to the October lows. You know, if we break below 4,300, I don't think we're going back down to October lows either. But that's going to be a key level that tells me, okay, we need to take some additional precaution at that point. Let the market prove to us that it's bouncing back. You know, wouldn't be a horrible thing to wait 100 points. Let that market move back up above that key resistance area and show that it was a false breakdown. And on that move back up, uh, it needs to be led by aggressive areas. So it's going to be a steady evaluation. But first case or first thing to think about, I wouldn't worry about it at this point, but losing 4,300 would be a big deal, technically. So watch that level. Um, moving on to the NDX, same thing pretty much. Here was the loss down to uh, 14.5. Um, if we go back, I'm going to go back two years here, do a quick annotation as well. There were a couple levels here. So 13.5, well, the August high was about 13.6, just under 13.7. Um, but one of the things that we were watching was to clear this level right here, right there. Also, this reaction high. That was kind of a big deal, getting through that level, went back, had a slight false breakdown, then jumped right back up, ended up going back through this 13.7 level um, and continued moving higher. But again, higher high, lower PPO, negative divergence. We had had a huge run up. Perspective is so important to keep in the stock market. We had gone from 10.7 at the beginning of the year to almost 16,000. That was about a close to a 50% move in six months, seven months. It's okay to pull back once in a while. You know, I know right now everyone's turning bearish. My gosh, options world. You'd think we were back down at the October low based on how heavy the puts have been played, which is awesome if you're in the bullish camp. That's what you want to see. You want to see that, that extreme pessimism. That's what marks bottoms. So I think we're, we're going back up. That's why I think that we continue to move higher from here. But here on the NASDAQ, I mean, we wouldn't go all the way back down to the August low 
until 13.7, we're at 15,000. So there's a lot of room still to the downside on the NASDAQ. Now you can start to maybe paint a couple of pictures here that you might, you know, wouldn't look so great technically. The one that kind of, that I look at, that looks like, um, you know, potential issue could be this break of a neckline. I mean, right now going up, we have a left side, left shoulder. Here's your left side of your neckline. There's your top with a negative divergence. It's a down sloping neckline. I don't like those. They have a little bit more of a bullish feel to them because we went below the low. If you have upsloping, I see a lot of people draw, you know, necklines for um, potential topping head and shoulders, and they use these upsloping lines. So let's say the low is up here or something. And so they draw this as a, a head and shoulder, and then you move up. I just look at this as an uptrend. I mean, you could break this neckline if this were the low over here. You could break the, this support line and this neckline, and you still haven't broken the support over on this side. So that's why I don't like upsloping necklines. Downsloping necklines, if we go back up to these moving averages, we'll have lower right shoulder versus left lower right side of the neckline uh, versus left. That to me kind of is like the leaning tower of Pisa here. I mean, we fall back below that and we've lost our support. We failed at the moving averages. I mean, those are the things that, you know, I'm looking ahead, just thinking losing 14.5 would kind of be a big deal because of that. So while we have good support down 13.7, 14.5 would be a head scratcher for me, at least you know, to think about. <clears throat> All right, IWM, big decline, bigger than I thought. I thought maybe we'd go back to this double top, but I was really initially looking for the 20 day to hold. We had a slight negative divergence. So maybe I should have been looking for the 50. We got that hammer on the 50 and I thought that was it. I thought, okay, here we go. Right back to the upside. This is what the market will do to you. It will humble you from time to time. Um, so anyway, I think we have a move maybe back to those moving averages, and then we'll see if we can get through. <clears throat> Transports, another slight negative divergence maybe at the top. We've pulled back, though, to that 50, and let's uh, actually just slightly below the 50, but look at this support here. There was your February high. And look at where we reversed from, holding on to that and now trying to get back through these moving averages. PPO, there's your reset, what I call reset. Anytime the PPO is on the center line or on the zero line, you have no momentum. Your short-term moving average, your 12-day EMA in this case, is exactly the same as your 26-day EMA. This, the PPO is just the difference between two exponential moving averages. The defaults, 12 and the 26. That's what I use because that's what most traders use. So if you're using technical analysis, try to predict what's going to happen. And you're using, um, if you're using moving averages that no one else uses or that a small minority uses, how can you predict what people are going to do if you're using something no one else is using or few others are using? So I like to stick with mostly the default settings just because I think the majority of traders are going to be looking at these numbers and these levels. And that's where I try to predict where I think market's going to bounce from. Transports, this is a big level. I'm not saying if we go below this 15.5 level that it's over, but it certainly wouldn't be a very good look. You know, if we break back down, the PPO is going to go negative. The 20 is already sloping back to the downside although we haven't seen a death cross yet. But what we want to see is the transports picking up. Didn't really see much of that yesterday. So let's get that transport group moving and let's get back through the 20-day moving average. These are some of the things I'll be looking for. All right, chart of the day. If you like the chart of the day, earningsbeats.com, go over. Make sure you scroll down and sign up for our free chart of the day. It comes out Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, directly to your email. Name and email address, all it takes. No credit card required. Not going to be charged. Um, you can unsubscribe at any time. You're not going to hurt my feelings. We put this out there just to give back to our community. Um, 
you know, I've learned a lot of things over the years, primarily from John Murphy, but others as well. And I do a lot of self-study and so forth, but everything I've learned, I try to give back, um, try to help people because I think the stock market is set up for failure for the majority. Um, when you've got professional money managers that can't beat the S&P 500 and about 80% of them can't, it's gonna be hard for individuals to do it, especially with all the emotional toll that it takes. When you've got your money in the stock market and all you're, you're hearing is the sky is falling, it's hard to stick to a plan. So we try to help coach, call us whatever you want, educators, coaches. Um, but I think our market guidance has been pretty spot on. And if you'd like to kind of look at some of the things we look at, make sure you subscribe there. So today I want to just bring up whole logic. <clears throat> because whole logic, if we annotate, <clears throat> You can see there's a neckline that comes across here. Left shoulder off of an uptrend. Left shoulder, neckline, head, neckline. I don't know, kind of like this double right shoulder. And then look at the volume pickup on the gap down. I think that was earnings related. Went back up and you can see where are we failing at? The neckline. We've now got the 20 day and neckline above us. Now I'm not a fan of shorting anything because I think we're in a secular bull market advance. But this is a stock I wouldn't own unless we can get back through 77 with, you know, in some meaningful way. 77.10 is probably not going to do it. But we see some volume come in. We get a move back up. We start to see some relative strength in the stock. Then that's when I would be a little bit more bullish. Until then, stock like this. And you know what? When I was looking at it up here, I was not thinking we were going to break down. But the key to a topping head and shoulder pattern is you've got to see that confirmation. And that's what we got with the earnings, the big gap down, the heavy volume, the failure to get back through. Now we've pulled back. I think we're trapped in a range right now, just below $73 to the downside and about 77 to the upside. Which one gives way first? Looking only at this pattern and not thinking anything about the overall market, my gut would say that we're going to break down. I mean, that's what you usually do in a head and shoulder breakdown. You test the neckline and then you go back down and set new lows. If we were in a bear market, you know, a steady downtrend in the overall market, I would be thinking about shorting the stock at the 20 day. I mean, even the current price up to say 77, I'd be building a position, maybe keep a stop above the 50 and I'd be looking for this thing to roll over hard. But that's not the market we're in, in my opinion. So I think you just watch this, see which way it breaks. Um, all right, last thing I want to talk about, two minutes till the market opens. Here's the scan that we like to run at Earnings Beats. This is one of our predefined scans that we've set up for our members. It's a downtrend reversal scan. And essentially, it's just looking at stocks that have been posting lower daily highs for five or six straight days. And then what you're looking for is right here, the daily high is greater than yesterday's daily high. But you can see yesterday's daily high was below the high from two days ago. And the high from two days ago was below the high from three days ago and so forth and so on until you go back five days. And at that point, this scan is telling you that a stock has been going down for, you know, roughly five, well, has been going down, putting in lower highs for five days in a row. And now for the first time in six days, it's put in a higher high. That does not guarantee us that a bottom is in is it, and it's reversing. We could go back down, but it's a good place to start looking for possible reversals. Now I ran this scan against all four of our strong or all four of our key chart lists. And I'm gonna go ahead and show you that um, scan result. We have a hundred. Now, what I can tell you is that I've been running this now for the last two or three days. We were seeing maybe 10, 15 stocks on this list. Yesterday, we saw 100. And if we sort it by industry group, 
You can see there are a couple autos, but I want you to look at a um, couple of key groups. Look at the semiconductors. Eight semiconductors had been printing lower lows for at least five straight, or excuse me, lower highs for at least five straight days. Yesterday, they put in a higher. One of them was Lamb Research with a PPO, or excuse me, a, a scooter of 96 and a half. Very strong stock. It had been going down, down, down. Showed a reversal. This group within the semiconductors, the semiconductor equipment manufacturers, I think look really good. Um, Lamb Research, probably one of the better ones. That one along with Applied Materials uh, certainly have my attention. Um, but then look at software. If this market is going to turn definitively to the upside, these are two groups we need to lead the market back. And you can see a lot of these stocks in this area, software, let's see, that's three, six, nine, 12, 15, 16 software stocks and eight semiconductors off of these four chart lists of ours. 24 stocks within those two groups showed signs of a possible reversal. And so one stock I'll just show you real quick was um, the semiconductor. I want to show you Lamb Research. So there's that reversal yesterday. Look at it. We're gapping up today. I mean, this is the stock I think is going to go back and test the high, especially if I'm right about the market reversing and going back up. This is going to be as likely a stock that's going to lead. Look at where it went to, right down to gap support. Reversed at gap support in the 50-day. And now two days later, off of this low, we're up $35. Already more than 5%. Applied Materials is the other one that I really like. This one came out with its earnings. I mean, it's about to break out to a, uh, another 52-week high. I think its all-time high was around 160. Um, I can probably tell you that. Uh, yeah, there's 160, probably 162 or 163, something like that. So it's... It's ready. It's been performing well. Look at the bounce also off the 20-week moving average. That's another bullish sign. But anyway, check those areas out. Software, semiconductors, those are going to be two keys as we move forward. But we really want to, I mean, if we're going to have big days and really start making a push back up toward the recent highs, we're going to probably need more than just semiconductors, software, and autos. We're going to need a lot of other groups to participate. Um, this rally started back in January when the technology area, communication services, those stocks took off. And then we started to see other areas kind of coming in and filling in. Well, we're kind of starting on a mini basis, that same um, trajectory at this point. We're starting to move up pretty strongly in some key areas, but we need the rest to follow suit. And that's what we need to watch for. All right, let's check out the market just opened. Um, see where we are, Dow down 22, S&P up 15, NASDAQ up 92, so that's 0.68, getting a little bit of strength in small caps as well. Tesla, you can see, up seven, one of the leaders yesterday, it's up again here today. Uh, Moderna had a big day yesterday, also up again today. NVIDIA, earnings tomorrow after the bell, making a run back toward the highs, actually above the high. Wow, this one two weeks ago was down at 400. It pulled back 20%. And this is probably what folks are anticipating, another big report out of NVIDIA coming up tomorrow after the close. If it does, that certainly would help the uh, semiconductor group. All right, that's it for me. Everybody have a great day. Appreciate you tuning in. If you're on YouTube and watching the show, please hit the like button and also subscribe to our channel. Uh, once you do that and turn notifications on, any events that we do live right here, you can, you'll get notified. So please like the video and then make sure you subscribe, turn your notifications on. Have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.